Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, and thank you for coming. I know that a lot of the draw for the day is the pitching and the panels and the workshops. So getting up at 9.30 uh, or slightly later, according to that clock, a lot later. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, I'm basically going to be talking a little bit about how um, I came to writing uh, and how that involved being a creative writing graduate. Um, I know most of you have been creative writing graduates, are creative gra writing graduates, or are maybe hoping to be, or considering whether it's worth it. Um, I'll be talking as well as about my experiences about um, ignorance, <laughs> doubt, anxiety, hesitation, speculation, supposition, and miscommunication. All those happy, positive words <laughs> that we're meant to use in networking, um, and how they can play a part in making you a better writer not only in terms of the fiction uh, or prose poetry, you brave souls that are, are trying to do that are doing that, um, but also how in terms of finding the publishers that are right for you and how they can find you, the writer that they need. Um, and in doing that, I think I'll start with a slide, but then a quotation from Ali Smith's novel, There But For Thee, um, and that is, it is important to know the stories and histories of things, even if all we know is that we don't know. And at events like this, um, I wish I'd gone to more events like this when I was a creative writing graduate, where you got to see some of the gears and nuts and bolts and oil slicks <laughs> and um, machinations that go on in the book industry. I very much started my um, MA in creative writing at Royal Holloway University not even knowing what I wanted to write. I had a sense that writers wrote novels, so I would do that. Ended up writing some short stories. Uh, and knowing that I'd always wanted to write was not quite the same as knowing what writing meant or meant that I had any idea of what was involved in, say, getting an agent, um, in courting, because that was the word that they were using as if we were peacocks looking kind of shy and rattling at one another, courting publishers, um, how to pitch a novel. The word pitch for me was very much about pitching back and forth on a ship and feeling rather ill, which some of you may recognize as a sensation um, and as a verb as well as what you're going to be doing later. But I did have a lack of confidence and I really do feel like organizations um, such as Comma Press putting on events like this today, they are meant to help you, they're meant to inspire you. Um, and throughout the day, I see some of you making notes. Don't take notes of what I'm about to say. <laughs> take notes generally during panels and workshops because these are people that have seen the writing and publishing world from every aspect. Um, in terms of this Ali Smith quotation, it's important to know the stories and history of things even if all we know is that we don't know. It is about putting yourself out there. You you've all started doing that today by coming um, and enrolling as delegates on this conference course. Um, even if all we know is that we don't know, is that it's okay to be feeling trepidatious. It's okay to be feeling tentative. It's okay to have passion and verve for writing and for your project, but to also feel, what am I doing? I'm all at sea, this is a dream that I want to realize. I want to make this either a career or I want to be able to concentrate, make more time for my writing. It's okay to, as part of that, be confident in your work, but feel like it's a big world out there and your piece of writing that's on a small, let's say A4 piece of paper with the perfectly chosen font or typeface, um, where will it go in the world? What's important is that you've, you've started. Um, you can't do anything with anything if it's just an idea. That's, that's the first step, and you're now on to the next step. Um, the word networking is often used. Can you see the subtle metaphor that I'm using today? Um, networking, I found when I was a graduate and still find slightly um, a word to be frightened of, much like pitch. I thought that if the writing was good enough, surely it would speak for itself. People would clamor at my door, which is not at all frightening at all, um, demanding more metaphors and alliteration and definitely, um, definitely those similes. That's what they really wanted. Um, and that I wouldn't have to put myself out there. I wouldn't have to print off, print off business cards or remember people's names or faces um, or 
try and seem like a character um, put on performances in, in kind of schmoozing. I'm not very good at that. Um, you can tell by the word um, just inserting itself. That's my catchphrase for the evening and morning. Um, but I went on my creative writing course not only to give me discipline in my writing, <coughs> saying, no, I'm dedicating time to this, time and money, so that I can try and hone my craft. And during this uh, creative writing MA, I met um, two poets. One of them was Declan Ryan, who is now one of the Faber New Poets. He also writes uh, poetry critique. There's also Liz Berry, who was part of Days of Roses. Days of Roses was a um, open mic night, basically, for prose and for poetry. Also as part of my course was uh, the, now we all know her as the writer of We That Are Young, Preeta Teneja. She's also the editor of Visual Verse, which is a um, online anthology of writing that is ekphrastic, and I know that one of the workshops is about ekphrasis, but it's where you, you, the viewer of the site, are given an image, and you are given an hour to respond to that image in, 50, in uh, 500 words, or if you're writing a poem, in 50 words. Um, but at the time, Preeti had, uh, she was a human rights activist, act activist, she was a human, right, and a human rights activist. Um, she was writing her first novel, um, and we were both trying to imagine a future where we could be writers, where we could have these mythical beings called agents and publishers. Um, and that was 10 years ago. And it's only really, it took 10 years for either of us to be published. Um, and during that time, we were both picked up by independent <coughs> presses. Um, for me, it was Influx Press. Um, Kit Catless, I know, is, is going to be here later this evening, probably with this evening. Later this evening. I'm really assuming that it's very late in the day. I'm not good at mornings. This is this comes later in the presentation. Writers and mornings. Um, morning with a U. But it was during this course that I was able to do wordplay and also find writers that were also at the same stage as me. They had different levels of confidence and they had different forms. They were, they were writing poetry, for God's sake. Why was I even talking to them? But through their real love for their work, the amount of time that they were able to put into their craft, putting on outside of the um, graduate systems hours, uh, nights for poetry and for prose, it meant that I was able to bring such confidence to, to uh, speaking in public, but also be able to keep abreast of writing that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise been aware of. I was not a natural poetry reader, certainly not contemporary poetry. Um, and as I kept going along the course, as I kept keeping up with what my cohort and my peers on the course were reading and writing, it meant that that too was kind of inking into my bloodstream. It meant that I was not just sticking with authors and writers and modes of thinking about writing that I was comfortable with. I was having to push myself um, in order to encounter new forms and to feel like I was part of a reading community, let alone a writing community. And that didn't feel like networking. That didn't feel like that terrible kind of holding a slightly too big hors d'oeuvre in one hand, and I've got small hands anyway, and a slightly too small, always, glass of wine and, and trying to say, like, what was my process? What was my praxis? Words that generally don't mean much beyond that kind of order of the hall of shame. Um, but this didn't feel like schmoozing, this didn't feel like networking, this felt like reading. And that was something that I knew I enjoyed and was good at and valued, which meant that I was better at valuing my own writing. Um, this is not my flat, and it's not the Holiday Inn I was staying at last night. This is a recreation of Proust's room. Um, lovely. Must say, my eye is drawn to the bed cover, but we're supposed to be looking at. I would like you to look at, the tiles that are on the walls. And some of you may know this, but Marcel Proust, who could bash out a, a sentence or two, he installed, I'm sure he didn't do it, um, cork tiling on his room that would act as uh, a buffering for sound. Because when he was writing, he didn't want any distractions. This went to the extent of he didn't want um, a fire or any external heat source in his room because he would worry that, that that would distract him from his writing. So he would wrap, and we all do this really, a fur coat around his feet to make sure that he was kept nice and warm as he was writing. 
And what I want to encourage you to do is don't buy fair guys, but um, consider when you're writing, be it your novel, be it your novella, be it your prose poem or your pitch um, for agents and for publishers, how much are you closing yourself in? How much have you decided that, no, I need not only cork-lined room, because I don't need any distractions, I need a cork-lined sleeping bag, and I need, there's a writer called Mark Saltzman who described he had a, a young kid, and he wanted to write and not have um, any distractions. He described, first of all, going into his car, so maybe a little bit quieter, he wasn't driving at the time, um, wrapping a towel around his head and just sitting there, just waiting for silence and the muse to descend. Um, this unfortunately backfired for him because cats would come and land on the roof of the car and that gentle plopping motion would just be this percussive kind of meter by which he had to write. Um, but how much uh, do we as writers, we prize rims of one's own. We prize the fact that we're able to conjure from nothing scenes that can go thousands of light years, scenes that can be about the tops of mountains or the kind of echoing chambers of a cathedral. But it's all coming from the silence of our own head and requires an amount of silence. Um, to be born out from, you know, uh, brain to hands to keyboard to screen or however you write. But sometimes that valuing um, or hierarchy that you set where silence and isolation is at the top does mean that you have a certain isolation of self. And again, I want to say how important conferences like this are, even though they can feel artificial, this one doesn't, sorry, <laughs> um, or they can feel like you're having to use a, a jargon or a vocabulary that you're unfamiliar with and maybe uncertain with. It is a way for you to meet your peers, to meet people that are creating these worlds that you really value. Um, so if you're able to afford an apartment like this, do it. But at the same time, leave that apartment occasionally, invite people back to your apartment to read your work. Um, I was uh, quite shy as a graduate and I would not have heeded this advice. So I turned to Twitter instead, and some of you, I'm sure, are, are on that great and completely non-problematic platform. Um, when I was there, the people that I interacted with included um, Joanna Walsh, whose most recent book, Breakup, is there. Um, also, Timothy Thornton, who is not a little fish, as, as demonstrated by this slide, but is a poet and composer and was recently in the Penguin Modern Poets um, new series of writers. And also um, Annex Press, which was a small independent press to the extent that it was one man called Nick with a printer that was printing off um, small chapbooks of work by people he admired and people he liked. Um, at the time, with all of these three people, I didn't know that they were writers. And I honestly, if I had known that, I would have talked to them less because I would have, because <laughs> they're terrible, because um, I would have felt overawed, I would have suddenly felt like my interactions, my conversation with them would have to be fueled with some kind of insouciant need, Machiavellian desire to have a share of their pie, to know how they did it and how I could do it too. Um, I would have felt overwhelmed with a sense that these weren't real people, these were public figures, um, and I wouldn't be able to approach them. But instead we were just talking about the usual um, stereotypes of what one talks about on Twitter are breakfasts, um, weird wordplay, punning. And they were introducing me again to writers and to modes of thought that I had never come across. Maybe this is, I'm slowly working out during the speech, this says more about me than it does about anything else. But they were making um, asides, they were making networks of association, network, um, that I had not yet been privy to or hadn't considered as a writer. Um, they were all involved, again, in independent presses that I would say are the backbone of, of the publishing world and allowing risks um, and opportunities for writers that aren't yet at the stage of being able to sell a complete product, perhaps. They definitely can sell complete products, but for in terms of those writers that have put their heart and soul and all their energy into a piece of work but don't quite yet know how to pigeonhole it or how to express themselves as, as I say, a character or a performer, um, it was definitely necessary for me to have this insight into independent presses. So Out With Annex Press came with dreadful grammar, as you can imagine, as just demonstrated. Um, Sketch, which was a chapbook of, I think, 16 pages, 
Um, you can't see the staples there, but it is stapled together by the fair hands of Nick. And this is the first time I saw my work um, commissioned and then in print. And it is a small thing. It's, it's a small, slim, gray thing, but that completely changed how I considered myself and my relationship with writing. Um, those of you that have already had work published maybe recognize that, that it can be throwaway, it can be cheap, it can be the most important thing in the world. It can be all three of those things and just in one small object. Um, this is not me, <laughs> and this is not Proust. This is um, Margaret Dura, who some of you may know as a screenwriter. Um, she was Oscar nominated, I believe, for her screenwriting. Um, and she's got a far tidier desk than I do. And what she said about time as a writer, the best way to fill time is to waste it. And that is really against what I've been saying about networking. <laughs> um, you should maybe be more adroit with your time. Surely you shouldn't waste it. But I felt like my time on Twitter was wasted time. I felt I was just having flippant conversations. I was enjoying myself a hell of a lot, but I felt like this wasn't writing. I was doing that terrible thing that some of you may recognize, maybe you're doing it even now, of having an open tab with the um, Twitter app going away when you should be writing for your NaNoWriMo, um, which has just started. Good luck, everyone. Um, but I now see that that wasn't wasted time at all. And again, not because of networking, not because I was somehow schmoozing without realizing it, but because I was finding my voice. I was finding a tone that actually spoke to me. I was finding something, again, that I valued uh, in terms of writing and in terms of reading. Um, in terms of desk comparison, this is E.B. White, um, who, which is, I mean, I'm sure I would write a hell of a lot better if I had that view, basically. I'm hoping that at this photograph, the cutoff point, you can't quite see where all the mess of real life is under his feet. But he wrote that um, analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested and the frog dies of it. Um, I add that not because it's relevant in any way, but it's a killer of a line. Um, more importantly, perhaps for what I'm talking about, he said in terms of his writing process, I rise in the morning torn between a desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. And maybe you have that too in terms of planning your writing days, if indeed you can have a whole day for writing. Um, that you want to be able to shock and awe and cajole and engage tremulous, unthought and unsaid emotions in your characters and in your description. Um, and the idea of being able to sum up the energy and the courage to do that while at the same time thinking, I have to get down 1,000 words, how on earth is this going to happen? Um, can sometimes be absolutely petrifying in the sense of rigidity, in the sense of turning to stone. Um, and you are not alone in that. You are certainly not alone in that, but you're, you've already conquered half of that, that battle, again, by being here, honestly. You, you, there are about 200 people, I'm sure, that thought about coming here today or wanted to and didn't because they didn't have that courage to do it. Um, here is, again, unfortunately not where I work, but this is Virginia Woolf and Vanessa Bells and many of the Bloomsbury set um, rooms, their studio in Charleston in Sussex that some of you may be familiar with. Um, and I include that there just so that I can include this quotation, which is well known, um, certainly by most of you, by Virginia Woolf. Um, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Um, and certainly you can start with money. She had her own press, which she started. You may not end up with a lot of it. Um, there's also the room, just to do comparisons of writers' rooms. Mine will not be there because, again, no one needs to see that. This um, psychopath's lair <laughs> is Will Self's writing room. Those of you that are fans of post-it notes and haven't been able to get any in the past 12 years, it's because he seems to have bought all of them. Um, he's also got a map of London there on his blinds, um, obscuring the actual view of London that he has. Um, but I'm just going to quote what, uh, some of what he said about his writing process that some of you may find familiar. This is, first of all, it starts with a sentence which I just want to add the caveat. He has said that the novel is dead. When I'm working on a novel, I type the initial draft first thing in the morning. Really, first thing. For preference, I have a cigarette ready rolled and a coffee percolator loaded the night before. Then I simply roll out of bed, fuel up and set to it. 
he doesn't sound set to it. Um, that's if he's in Famous Five. I believe the dreaming and imagining faculties are closely related, such that wreathed in nighttime visions, I find it possible to suspend disbelief in the very act of making stuff up, which, in the cold light of day, would seem utterly preposterous. I've always been a morning writer, and frankly, I believe 99% of the difficulties novices experience are a result of their unwillingness to do the same. Narrative structure, mise-en-scene, characterization, you can't get to grips with these problems unless you put the words on the page. He goes on. So my rule is, I don't rise from my desk until I've done my allotted portion. When I began writing seriously, I measured my word counts in Conrad's, what a scamp, one Conrad being 800 words, which is what the master wrote daily, an output on which he was able to support a considerable establishment, including two housemaids and a chauffeur. Me too, no. Um, <laughs> back in the 1990s, I could manage two or even three Conrads in a morning, but with age and possibly the increasing complexity of the work itself, humble, my pace has slowed, and now I manage 1.25 Conrads. My journalism rate, by contrast, is 500 words per hour. Um, this is in contrast to Nabokov, um, another in-car writer rather than writer-in-residence. And you can just see there in what is a lovely card, um, Nabokov writing on little index cards. Um, <coughs> you can see one of them there with a little doodle of a gun, which is um, a bit more high-tech than a little hangman doodle. He also, some of you may know, um, was a butterfly collector. And indeed, up there is a sketch of one of the butterflies that he discovered and is named after him. Um, what Nabokov wrote about writing was, I do not begin my novel at the beginning. I do not reach chapter three before I reach chapter four. I do not go dutifully from one page to the next in consecutive order. No, I pick out a bit here and a bit there till I've filled all the gaps on paper. And you can see that really in someone that writes on index cards. Um, they are literally shuffleable in a way that perhaps if you're writing like me on a word processor, that makes me sound so Victorian, on um, whatever you kids are writing on nowadays, where it is just one long lozenge that you just have to scramble along the squeaky clean surface of. You scrabble on lozenges, right? Um, there's something about note cards that are tactile, that you're able to lay them down and see them um, in any order that you'd like. And maybe if some of you are struggling with your writing or are feeling like, no, I've, I've got the general sense of it, I've got the tone, I've got the characters, do consider, I'm sure maybe many of you have done this, writing down the main points on index cards and seeing whether the shape of it, the architecture of it, the blueprint of your story could be rearranged and shuffled. Um, I also just want to say that this is the annotations of Susan Sontag on um, some James Joyce. Some of you in, in the audience here that might be librarians may have just howled and spat into the, uh, into the auditorium. Um, here is someone that was not afraid of annotation. I think it's fair to say. I, as an undergraduate, would have seen this and recoiled because as an undergraduate, it had been drummed into me that books were sacrosanct and were meant to remain um, objects of desire. And the thing with unrequited love is that objects of desire shouldn't be touched or approached often. And the idea of, of um, filleting a text like this, of, of literally putting your own words onto the page and, and providing context for it with a marginalia like this, and this seems like such a small point. I only really learned that as a creative writing master's student. Um, it meant that the text for me was starting to become approachable. It was something that I did value and valued it so much that I thought I could have anything to do with it. Um, here's a picture of Susan Sontag wearing a bear costume, so she's not too intimidating um, as, far as, as far as bears go. Um, in terms of uh, Sontag, and people that can do keynote speeches very well. Something she said to Vassar College commencement speech as part of her commencement speech in 2003 was do stuff, I agree. Be clenched, curious, not waiting for inspiration, shove or society's kiss on your forehead. Pay attention. It's all about paying attention. Attention is vitality. It connects you with others. It makes you eager. Stay eager. 
And for me, attention, not only in terms of how to lose attention via Twitter, but also being attentive with my writing on a sentence by sentence level and opportunities that are out there. Through Twitter, I was able to find out about um, the white review competition, short story competition, um, and on a whim sent in some pieces of prose. Uh, they were then shortlisted. That again did something with confidence for me. Um, there was a hell of a lot of luck involved in that, in seeing the call out for submissions, in getting onto the shortlist. But you can only be lucky if you are attentive, if you are doing stuff. Um, and I guess as part of that, I want to really emphasize that you are multiform beings of many, many talents. And if you feel like one of your projects is just being too stodgy, or you've been working on it for 10 years and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, that doesn't mean that it's useless. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't be the project that's going to make your name or be the one that um, defines who you are as a writer. But try other things. Try short stories if you only write novels. Try librettos if you only write short stories. Um, try haikus if you've really given up. Um, but, but be clenched and be curious. I wish I could say this now in 575 um, meter. Stay eager to, to remember that you are a writer. You really are. And you have a voice and a vision and a way of seeing the world that no one else has. And only you can communicate that. So do communicate that. Stay eager to um, do that for the sake of your talent, for the sake of us, the readers, who, who need to hear from you. Here we have um, some pages from Mark Twain's notebook. Um, I was told that this was a picture of potential character names that he has. But I'm pretty sure that that one that's third from the bottom on this page does say Diarrhea Hutchinson, which is a brilliant name. But he, I mean, he never published that, did he? There's going to be a Twain scholar in the, in the audience will be like, yeah, yeah, that's his famous novella, Diarrhea Hutchinson. Um, but again, for me, I'd always written mostly on my phone, whether in drafts on, on uh, dreaded Twitter um, or in the notes app. <laughs> If you've been told this before, and some of you will have taken it on board, but do carry a notebook around, because you'll be on the bus one day, and Diarrhea Hutchinson will be there, and you'll be like, wait, that would be the perfect name for the villain slash heroine slash dog um, of one of my characters. And you never know when, it's not that inspiration strikes at any time, but it's a lot more likely to be a strike that's remembered if you do have a notebook with you and you're able to take notes. You'll notice here the kind of spidery handwriting and I'm desperately trying to keep to a metaphor of spidery network webbing. So we'll just plant that in the mind. Um, in terms of beginnings then, I've kind of spoken about how I started as a writer. Um, it was through going to a reading um, as part of Days of Roses, which was the student-run uh, poetry prose night, that in the audience uh, was a member of Influx Press. Um, he said, do you write lots of short stories? I got all my confidence together and said, yes. Um, he said, oh, do you have um, a collection? And I said, oh, no, I don't have a collection. I don't have anything to show anyone. I'm useless. I'm dreadful. Don't look at me. Um, in the past, I, because of uh, some of the way that the graduate conference um, that I wish I had gone to uh, when I was doing it, there was some interaction with agents and all of them were very kind to me and they said like we'd love to talk to you once you've got a novel we really like your writing we really enjoy the style that you have and some of the voice that you have some of the voice I remember that um, and they said please come back when when you have a novel and I didn't have one and I suspected at the time that I never would so I, I shrunk away I went back to my cork lined cocoon or web I suppose cork lined web, imagine that. Um, and I thought to myself, well, this is going to go nowhere. I'll be writing for myself. I will always be doing that, but it'll go nowhere. But the next question that Kit um, of Influx Press asked me was, well, we, would you like one? Would you like a collection of short stories? Which is very different from, do you have one? Um, and I said, yes. And what came out of that was, was Atrib, um, which I uh, am forever thankful that, that Influx Press gave me a chance with that. Um, but how does one start a short story? And I mentioned that because I said I would like to very much do a collection of short stories. Um, he then said, what would you like 
the collection to be called. I said Atrib and other stories. And it was only, I think, a week before publication that we realized I hadn't written a short story called Atrib, um, which kind of tells a lie to, to the title. So I quickly had to drum up that. Um, and when you think about short stories, the first, how do you inspire yourself? If you've seen the deadline, you're like, okay, I've been told by that brilliant keynote speaker that I have to seize every opportunity. There's a deadline today uh, for 12 p.m., which is noon, I think. Uh, at visual verse, this 500 words um, to respond to an image. I've got the deadline. What do I do? Um, how do I start? Let's go imagery. What happens? And the most famous one is once upon a time, right? And I started to think, what is meant by that? That's a very strange grammatical construction. I recognize it. I say it often to myself, which again says more about me than anything else. Um, but how, what associations do I have with that? Um, once upon a time, why is that the kind of initial, the ignition for so many folk tales and folk stories in the West? Um, and if I may, I kind of prepared a small short story that's about once upon a time and about beginnings and about familiarity with um, the ignition for short stories. And it's kind of based both on the phrase once upon a time, but also on um, these quotations from the writer Peter Handke that some of you may know, he's an Austrian writer. And those quotations are, if a nation loses its storytellers, it loses its childhood. Then the second one, when the child was a child, it didn't know that it was a child. Everything was soulful and all souls were one. And the third one, I couldn't say who I am. I haven't the remotest notion of myself. I'm someone without antecedents, without a history, without a country. And on that, I insist. And once upon a time is a stock phrase used to introduce a narrative of past events, typically in a fairy or folk tale. It signals the start of a story. It is a stock phrase, a stock expression, stock as in a broth made by steeping bones, fee, fi, fo, fum, or expression as in metaposcopy, a form of divination by which one attempts to predict personality, character, and destiny based on the pattern of lines on a subject's forehead. This is why I have a fringe, none of you can tell anything about me. When you look at my face sometimes, for example, when I raise my eyebrows, one, two, there is the capital letter I fallen on its side. When I frown, the letter W. If I lie on my side and frown, this letter W is a topsy-turvy capital E. You make me frown on my side and spell this out the capital I, the W, the E. The practice of metaposcopy, as you all know, was banned by Pope Sixtus V in 1586. Once upon a time, stock expression, as in this joke shared between me and you. I've heard the market crash today, and I said, uh-oh, I'd better go check on my stocks. So I head to the backyard where the banker says, please, please let me out of these stocks. And I say firmly, no, <laughs> you do not start jokes with once upon a time. A set phrase to set the story then is once upon a time, a set phrase in English, as in j'ai set phrase, I have seven strawberries in French. I have seven daughters, severe brides for seven sons with seven pairs of out of your league boots in league cahoots with the old woman who lived in a shoe, a woman who shouldn't throw glass slippers nor red cap shoes, even if they are as red as seven red strawberries, dwarfed and swarthy and swarthy and dwarfed and halved and heavy as 1,003 bears, bear cupboard mattresses, all propped up on a pea, frog green and kissed unto cinders in the east riding hood with a carpenter or a woodsman, and the fact that I'm a real boy once above a time, spun out and in and like a preposition in the here and now, spun out in text and textile, spindly and needle pricked, sows and sows before pearls, snow before gold, goats before bridges, tolls before trolls, all in red hot shoes. And once a bun and once upon a time when the stars were hot, best beloved, now cold, they glinted wish warm in our blue, blue sky, flagging only a little. And they were not too cold, not too hot. The stars were just right. And as a class, we threw the jack of hearts. We clubbed together and declined hopscotch as a noun. Hop sketch, hep scat. We hot scorched in the snow once upon a time before the ovened candy house deep in the woods, before the pieces of eight, before the dwarves were dwarfed and the elves were found to be elfin and finalized before form itself when the thumb prick in the forest timed us out upon and beside ourselves. In English, 
The set phrase is traditionally once upon a time. In Albanian, once there was. In classical Arabic, there was, oh there was, or wasn't in the oldest of days and ages and times. In um, Catalan, there was a time, and my best beloved, I would hold these seven strawberries out to you for as long as the stars cool seven leagues above us, while seven leagues across the seven seas as you or I and we in our safe hammock of this caesura, breaking the line on my forehead. In Chinese stories, they start a very, very long time ago. And in Croatian, there was a, and in Czech, there was and there was not, beyond seven mountain ranges, beyond seven rivers, while children in Esperanto are told in a time already long past when it was still of use to cast a spell. And in Estonian, it begins behind seven lands and seas there lived and a Filipino stock phrase that ran through a clearing and it ran at the beginning of time. While in Finnish, they begin with once there was and the Brothers Grimm said, Es war einmal in den Zeiten, als das Wunschen noch geholfen hat. Who told the Brothers Grimm bedtime stories, I wonder, as they lay young in their bunks, their foreheads spelling out capital letter I or W-E and recalling third-person narrations. In modern Greek, the set phrase is that this is an old story, while in Hungarian, once there was, there wasn't. Serbian stories begin traditionally, there once was one, and we learn that nothings once for once singly or so long ago belong and long to be belonging to reach for what's lost. The clasps of a fede or gimel ring closing hands, one upon the other, taking strength and taking stock. And as we crane our heads to catch the story, cup our hands to catch like burrs on wool, we follow the breadcrumbs, release the four and twenty birds, but count on them as if they were magpies, counting down in our counting houses, losing or loosing the thread of our pronouns, spinning, weaving, woven, text of textiles as a thousand knights draw into the chest, drawn apart like curtains, drawn like the well, drawn like my face, cast like your play, cast like a dice, like a spell, like bronze or something as light as a story on your breath. And every night the wolves were wolving and huffing and puffing, and the dwarves were in sheep's plurals, and I cried wolf as wolves were wolving and calves were carving with a dish and the spoon and dwarves were dwarving and fairies falved in the far room in the starlight, in the bedtime, in the book heft, in the love lawn, soft lawn, bed born, boom time of a stoved breath stowed away. My stock phrase is a changeling whisper that if a nation loses its storytellers, it loosens and that as a nation, it will then tighten its grip on other books and ears, yours and mine. And time can only be once so often, winced at or winched in so often, if you only care to listen, best beloved, when you and I swap stories in the moonlight, in the soft light, in the sweet nothings and held somethings, and the hope that you and I might leave together not as one, but not yet parted, and other stock phrases. And the notion there really is that once upon a time, there is no thing as once upon a time. You're in control of that. Your stories will be timeless and of this time. They can relate to that paradox. They can live within that. Um, some of you will be writing stories that other delegates' children will be reading uh, at university as a set text. Some of you are writing stories that you'll tell at Christmas and will make someone's day. Some of you will be writing stories or editing stories that you wrote for Halloween to scare the sweet bejesus out of someone <laughs> and you will have qualified for them who they are as a person. Um, I think that's why we're all drawn to writing and certainly to reading, that it is a way of communicating through tiny scratches on paper and just ink <coughs> filling on minuscule runnels on, on text. Um, how it is to live as a person and how it is to understand or misunderstand the world. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what some of you are writing, and I can't wait to read your work. Thank you very much. Um, I'd say so many sevens in beginnings. I think it's actually because for folk tales and for fairy stories, it's a way for communicating to children aspects of the 
a greater world and society. So seven is a useful number, seven, right? Seven is a useful number for saying days of the week. And I think often 12 is in stories and in beginnings as well. Um, there'll be uh, 12 daughters. It's always the youngest one that gets the goods. Um, she says as a mizzle daughter. Uh, so I think that this iteration and, and uh, reappraisal of numbers are a way of introducing two children, but also for, for adults that enjoy pattern making. Um, I think that's probably why the number seven comes up so often. Yeah. Good question. I know that certainly in terms of aesthetics, uh, odd numbers seem um, more appealing than even numbers. And that, you know, the number seven is invested often in kind of divination and in more esoteric practices with ideas of luck that maybe there are just some numbers and patterns that feel very appealing. And that's fascinating that it could even be seen as a genetic imprint. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about um, confidence and building confidence in voice. Um, when you were putting your collection together, were you a lot more confident about some stories than others? And did you have to kind of fight for some of them or change some of them to bring them all up to the same level? I find as a short story writer, I don't often give people the work to read until I feel like it is finished. And that means they never read it. So um, with the stories I felt most confident in, they were the ones that I'd sent to competitions or they were the ones that um, had been published in uh, either in small press publications or in journals. Um, again, maybe I should have said that in my talk was keep sending things out, find out what journals you enjoy the material. <coughs> Um, that, that's published there and send stuff in um, because if anything if nothing comes of it at least you will have formatted your work uh, ready for publication I think in terms of did I have to fight for any of them to go in it was probably the other way around that Kit was saying like please don't include this one <laughs> we want to be viable as a business um, uh, which I believed in so you'll never see them none of you um, but I did feel that the arrangement of the collection uh, that had never occurred to me as, as crucial or important. They certainly haven't been written, you know, page one, this one, page 15, the second one. Um, and that was, uh, I found that an interesting process in working out whether it would be about the reader's attention span and would they want to read, you know, a short story followed by a long one, followed by a short one, or would it be best to have all the short ones at the beginning so that they could dip in and then once I've hooked them, um, then maybe they would stay with me for a bit longer with those characters. Um, and that was, that was a kind of a Tetris of seeing what fitted in the best way. Um, do you write short stories? Have you written a collection? No. <laughs> Yet, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I found that a really, I, I find it very difficult to write longer form fiction, I think because of this, um, almost physical sense that I can't see it, it how it was slot together until it's finished. Um, and so with collections, it was a case of rereading them, seeing if there was imagery that made interesting kind of shapes and, and ricochets and kind of pinball machines throughout the collection or whether they were bunching usefully and, and more providing kind of ballast or, or buttresses for, for the text. Um, that's a really great question, thank you. Will there be a novel or will there always be short stories? Uh, <laughs> um, the, a novel has been is under contract um, it does not yet exist if my editor's in the audience it does exist <laughs> um, but uh, you didn't see me right <laughs> I have an alibi today um, yeah I am trying to write uh, a novel it's all about false entries and dictionaries um, so let's go through a slide this is now free advertising um, basically uh, this, oh no, um, this uh, zoological uh, sketchbook is of a Jungftag bird. Uh, you may not have heard of a Jungftag, but basically that's um, defined in a Webster's dictionary as a bird that on one side, the male of the species has a wing on one side and a kind of hook on the other, and the female has a wing on this side and an eye of bone on the other, and it's only when they're united together that they can fly away and take off from the ground. And basically, in most dictionaries and encyclopedias, there are these fake entries in, um, in the body of the text. And they're included there, whether as copyright traps um, or as just jokes, hoaxes on the part of the, of the lexicographer. Um, and it's not 
necessarily an error, so something that's been misspelled or, or misdefined. Um, it's been inserted there just as a kind of spurious almost work of fiction, and I've really been drawn to these. Um, I'm often drawn to, as you can tell, like uh, messing up language and not necessarily understanding its, its full complexities and misusing it. I find, luckily, I find that fascinating the amount that I do it. Um, and it's not just a lexicographer having a kind of idiosyncratic way of defining things. There's um, some of you may have the Chambers Dictionary. And one of the editors there used to take his job very seriously, but also take his humor very seriously, if that's not an uh, oxymoron. Um, and he, for example, the word eclair, some of you may have had some this morning if you were feeling really like you needed energy. And he defined eclair as a cake that is great in length, but short in duration. <laughs> and if you didn't know what an eclair was and you'd gone to a dictionary to find this out, that'd be no use whatsoever. But the idea of um, dictionaries and encyclopedias being these kind of... Um, repositories of, of humour and strangeness and not and fiction rather than fact is something I'm drawn to and, and the novel will be kind of playing with ideas of that hopefully um, but thank you for that opportunity to sound off about that and feel guilty thanks <laughs> just want to know with, um, when you do your um, writing do you ever get experience like um, bringing personal experiences into your writing or get inspiration from anything that you're interested in even if it's just something you see out the window or like just everyday kind of things from your childhood and adolescence and so on? I don't write um, from kind of autobiography. It's I do think that although maybe there's a sustained tone and voice that is uh, certainly in the short stories that is undeniably born of how maybe I spiral out <laughs> or um, see the world, the scenes themselves tend not to be um, uh, drawn from real life. It, it tends to be, that's not entirely true. It, it will be what you mentioned, um, that you're in a room and you just notice something strange and you think that, why is that unsettling to me? Why is that odd? And that image or that circumstance will then become the center of the, the short story. Um, I tend to write work that finds if I was on my precocious days, it's work that uh, makes the momentous out of the moment. So it'll be a, a glimpse of something that is then harried as an idea or, or parsed and, and um, unraveled as, as the character usually unravels alongside. Um, I am no good at, at writing kind of overarching storylines that take in millennia and have third person narrators <coughs> that are able to kind of um, gather together many psychologies. Um, so to answer your question in a very too fulsome way, um, I draw on the real world and its strangenesses, but I don't seek out to um, illustrate times in my life or, or scenes from my life in particular. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank mm -hmm. you.